欢迎收看今天的汉天新闻，我是张潇。首先来看美国国内消息，美国国会众议院针对总统川普的弹劾调查目前处于公开听证阶段。白宫副新闻秘书在二十一日的一份报道中表示，川普总统期望这起弹劾案能够提交给参议院进行审理。他同时表示，希望能最终听到那些实际见证或参与过腐败的证人的证词。比如众议院情报委员会主席亚当·西夫、乔·拜登、亨特·拜登等。目前，西夫正主导着对川普的弹劾调查。House Democrats moving one step closer to impeaching President Trump, building their case that he orchestrated a plan to withhold military aid and dangled a White House meeting in exchange for Ukraine announcing investigations into his political rivals. Multiple Democratic sources telling CNN they're hoping to wrap up by Christmas, including holding proceedings before the House Judiciary Committee, drawing up articles of impeachment against Trump, and holding a vote on them. We'll regroup、uh, next week and and talk about the steps moving forward. But their investigation has hit some roadblocks, with the White House and State Department both stonewalling Democrats from accessing important documents. And having access to top administration officials allegedly involved in the scheme. What I would like to see happen next is that Ambassador Bolton and Secretary of State Pompeo、uh, do exactly what the very brave and courageous people who worked for them did, which is to step forward and put patriotism up for their country ahead of their own personal interests. Still, Speaker Nancy Pelosi says they have enough evidence to press forward. No, we're not going to wait till the courts decide. We can't wait for that because, again, it's a technique. It's obstruction of justice, obstruction of Congress. House Republicans disagree. I think we've had enough. I think it's time to shut it down. The truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God. In the last hearing of the week, former White House national security official Fiona Hill described Ambassador Gordon Sondland's role in Trump's actions towards Ukraine. He was being involved in a domestic political errand, and we were being involved in national security foreign policy, and those two things had just diverged. The White House's former top Russia adviser also dismantling Trump's debunked conspiracy theory that it was Ukraine, not Russia, that interfered in the 2016 elections. I refuse to be part of an effort to legitimize an alternate narrative. These fictions are harmful, even if they're deployed for purely domestic political purposes. David Holmes, an aide at the U.S. Embassy in Ukraine, detailing the phone conversation he overheard between Sunlin and President Trump just one day after the president's now famous call with Ukraine's leader. The president's voice was loud and recognizable. I then heard President Trump ask, "So he's going to do the investigation?" Ambassador Sunlin replied that he's going to do it. Holmes quoting Sunlin as saying the president did not care about Ukraine. Instead, he only cared about big stuff that benefits the president, like the Biden investigation that Mr. Giuliani was pushing. 再来看国际方面的消息，伊朗政府本月十五日宣布上调汽油价格并实行配给，在国内引发不满。当天晚些时候，多座城市开始爆发示威游行。目前示威已蔓延至一百多座城镇，上百家银行、商店遭洗劫或纵火，造成至少几十人死亡，大约一千名示威者被捕。日前，伊朗革命卫队指称街头抗议活动已结束，但他们对民众的血腥残酷镇压受到了各国政府和国际组织的谴责，称要对伊朗政府进行制裁。They killed him. A voice cries out. Crowded around what appears to be a lifeless body. Seconds later, on the same video, another group of men carry away someone else. A snippet of the violence that has rippled across Iran in the last week as protesters rage over a sharp spike in fuel prices. The country is in the midst of an unprecedented near-total internet shutdown. Information trickles out slowly. With a handful of videos and photographs hinting at the scale and brutality of what is taking place in the capital, people shout, "Death to the dictator!" Tehran University students chant for the release of their friends now in government custody. Riot police are seen out in force across the capital. 
Anger mutated into violence as rioters stormed banks, torched petrol stations and government buildings. The speaker on this clip claims that the Quds City Hall is on fire, saying this was a symbol of corruption, a claim CNN cannot confirm. The echo of gunfire can be heard in other video clips. Wednesday, the United Nations said it had seen reports of a significant death toll during the recent protests. But there is no way to verify the numbers, although the government on Sunday acknowledged several deaths. The internet blackout has succeeded in stemming the flow of information, both within the country and to the outside world. And the government declared victory over its enemies. Those anarchists who came out onto the street were few in number. However, they were organized, armed anarchists with prior planning, and they are based on a plot that the region's reactionary, the Zionists and Americans, had hatched. It's a narrative consistently repeated by the Iranian government when its people take to the streets, an effort to discredit the demonstrators, as much as arguably an attempt to conceal the reasons behind their rage. Iran is loath to admit it is feeling the strain of economic struggle brought on by U.S. sanctions, a tanking currency, food and medicine shortages, coupled with Iran pillaging its own coffers to prop up proxies across the region. And while we don't yet have a complete understanding, we have enough pieces to know that while Iran may continue to block the flow of information through the Internet, its rulers cannot control the picture that is emerging. Arwa Damon CNN, Istanbul. Isilia this evening, we are witnessing a governmental coup attempt against a prime minister by false libel and with a tendentious and contaminated investigation process. A defiant response to corruption charges unveiled against him. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is facing charges of bribery, fraud and breach of trust in three separate corruption investigations against him. Alleging Netanyahu received lavish and expensive gifts from overseas businessmen and paid for favorable news coverage. It's the first time ever that a sitting Israeli prime minister is facing a criminal indictment. Former Netanyahu cabinet member, now Attorney General Avichai Mandelbelt, announced the charges against Netanyahu. The decision to indict him was, uh, was taken with a very heavy heart, and yet I am very pleased with my decision in the interest of the public and the, cit the citizens of Israel. Netanyahu claims he's innocent, and the nearly three-year investigation against him is a media-fueled witch hunt. The time has come to investigate the investigators. I'm Andy Rose reporting. 日前法国内政部发布了一项统计数据，资料显示，2018年法国有至少137名女性遭到自己的配偶、前夫或前男友杀害。这相当于每三天就有一名法国女性死于家暴。这个惊人的数字引发了当地政府的密切关注。而据了
and a debate is now raging here about the culture that allows this to happen and the language used to describe this violence is right at the heart of it. There is a lot of expression which diminish the level of the violence. Family drama is used to describe a murder, a feminicide. Femicide is the killing of a woman because she is a woman, and most often by her partner. That's what authorities believe happened to Marie-Alice Dibon. Her body was found stuffed in a suitcase and dumped in a river. You're devastated, you're disgusted, you're ashamed that something like that could happen to your family. And, um, and you think, what a waste. I love those. This is really her. She was already caring. He did everything so that she couldn't fight back. Why do you think he did it? Because I think he understood there was no coming back. She was going to leave him. A relationship ends and a murder follows. It's a brutally common story here and one that is often reported in a troubling way. It's subtle and there is always a sense on it happened because she deserved it. That implication has become a focus for many activists here with a clear message to the authorities and to the media. This is a crime that needs to be taken more seriously. There is still media who speak of drame conjugal, crime passionnel. And why is that important? What does that imply? It doesn't recognize the reality of the crime. There is no love in the story. There is just violence. To help the estimated 200,000 women suffering this violence, the French government has pledged over $5 million and launched a national debate on the issue of femicide. There are 250 rapes each day, so it's a, big, it's a big problem, it's a big issue. This issue dates all the way back to 1804, when the Napoleonic Code legally made women inferior to men. France's laws may have changed, but the culture and the media have been slow to follow suit. He hurt his wife because he didn't like the soup. He was trying to seduce women with a vegetable, drunk, coma. He went into the wrong room and into the wrong woman. This is some kind of a pun, a play on words. But the thing is, it's talking about a rape of a woman. Violence against women is not a funny story. It's something that you have to talk about like a fact of society, something that happens very regularly. Femicide is just the very tip of the iceberg, the result of something a lot bigger. And this can only change if the culture change. Rosie Tompkins, CNN. Yizon 并有过犯罪记录的情况下，依然派遣他到世界各地进行工作。面对镜头，这名神父没有表达出歉意或后悔。Hello，Hello，Hello，Hello，Hello，Hello，Hello，Hello，Hello，Hello，Hello，Hello
Well, we will, of course, be speaking to the, um, the managers of Caritas about our findings. Thank you for whatever this was. Excuse me, I'm back.